Pay with us for a series of lectures on cosmology. We had been waiting for these lectures since November 2006. He had inaugurated this center. He does not require any formal introduction. He is the only scientist today in the country who is known to all the sections of Indian society. He has widely written on science policy of India. He has reached common people of the country through his popular writing. For school children, he has written wonderful popular books and short stories. Last but not the least, wonderful NCRT books have been compiled in physics under his supervision. He is a celebrated scientist, but he is not only that. He is not only celebrated scientist, he is a movement for science in this country. And, you know, the young minds, many young minds today, are attracted to science career <coughs> thanks to efforts made by Professor Narlikar. He established a wonderful institute called Ayuga in Pune. Ayuga is established with a mission. And this is the expression for the ideas and thoughts of Professor Narlikar. It had a mission, noble mission, to support research in the university sector. Our center is really inspired, totally inspired, by the philosophy of Ayuka. And we have been supported really through various mechanisms of Ayuka. I am indebted to him that he is here for the series of lectures on cosmology, which is a great support to the center, to all of us. Still, there will be no formal word of thanks. Sir doesn't like those rituals. So I'll thank him in advance for the interesting lectures that he's going to deliver to us. And I request all of you to switch your mobiles off. Okay. And I also request to give questions at the end of the lectures, because he has to cover certain amount of material. So I Thank you, Professor Sami, for very kind introduction. I <coughs> recall visiting this center in the early days, and now uh, the center is flourishing, and I wish the center further successes and expansion in its activities in the years to come. I am talking about cosmology, and as you see, uh, is there a, uh, a pointer or uh, okay? As you see here, I've said from the sidelines. So what I mean is the following: uh, maybe you have been watching hockey matches, and you will be watching football, World Cup. So <clears throat> when you watch the uh, match. Uh, you can watch it as a spectator uh, sitting further out, and you can be more concerned but not direct participant in it. Uh, if you are a coach or a, a replacement player, you, you are sitting on the sidelines and you are watching what is going on. You cannot interfere with the match, but you are deeply interested in it. So my role in giving, describing cosmology today is that of a person who has been involved with the subject, is deeply concerned about it, but not actually playing an active role uh, in what I am going to describe. So it's a description which, has <coughs> which dates back to history much before my time and uh, relates to areas much more than what I have myself been uh, connected with but I am interested in all of them. <coughs> and as you see here, uh, I had given these lectures in the first form in uh, European Southern Observatory in Munich uh, in 2006. And <coughs> since they are more of a historical development of things from there to the present, 
the, broadly the subject matter has not changed. So I start with this question, when did modern cosmology begin? And <clears throat> when you ask this question, you find that the answer depends on who is answering, because people have different perceptions. So if you ask an old fashioned relativist, he will say that it started with Einstein's paper in 1917, when he applied his equations of gravitation to the whole universe and came up with the conclusion that he needs a cosmological constant in order to get any solution which was of a static nature. And in those days, 1917, there was no indication uh, that the universe as a whole is expanding. So Einstein believed that any good theory must produce a static model. And general relativity did not do it, so he modified the equations to put in the extra term called the lambda term or cosmological constant. Then came the actual discovery uh, in 1929 when Hubble found a general law that the universe is not only uh, showing <coughs> movement of galaxies, but the galaxy motions are systematic. So the further a galaxy is from us, the faster is it moving away. And <coughs> so if you ask uh, a, an astronomical observer, when does he think cos cosmology as a subject began, he would say that it really started with 1929 uh, when Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. Uh, I should push. How do I go? Down. Not moving. Okay. Okay, then you can then ask, bring physicists into the picture. The physicists uh, uh, had stayed apart from cosmologists, uh, thinking it was a highly speculative subject. But if you now involve them, uh, they said, yes, yes, cosmology began to have some introduction of physics with the uh, work by George Gamma, who showed that if the universe uh, has been expanding for, from its beginning, it must have been very hot in the past and so hot that it acted as a fusion reactor, thermonuclear reactor. And then nuclear physics came into the calculations and that is why the physicist is introduced. Then if you ask an astronomer physicist, that physicist and astronomer together or you, what you call astrophysicist if you like, they really got interested with the discovery by Penzias and Wilson in 1965, which was the discovery of the microwave background. And according to them, uh, cosmology really began with, with the discovery of cosmic microwave background. But uh, in my opinion, uh, the correct answer to the question is that modern cosmology began with Newton. Normally what you think is that uh, any issue in physics, when you look at it, Newton had thought of it earlier, but cosmology was something you think was not uh, in Newton's uh, purview and he was more concerned with solar system. But that is not the case. He was interested in the whole universe. He had gone on to construct a model of the universe and there is a correspondence with uh, a divinity student, Richard Bentley, uh, during 1692-93, uh, in which Newton had said that uh, there is a, he first writes uh, <coughs> that uh, there is a model of the universe which, uh, as you saw here, matter distributed very uniformly in all directions. So completely uniformly distributed matter. Take any particular point uh, in such a universe, it is attracted by 
uh, gravitational forces according to his inverse square law from all directions. So, if you uh, work out in this direction, you will get a certain force. In this direction, you will get certain force. In fact, if you assume an infinite universe, you will get an infinite force in all directions. But they will tend to cancel each other and you will get zero here. So, perhaps this was the first attempt at renormalization that Newton had got this answer as zero and he said the universe remains static. So, <coughs> that was how he had described here. It seems to me that if the matter of our sun and planets and all the matter, it said the old English uh, which I have co copied, in the universe was evenly scattered throughout the heavens and every particle had an innate gravity towards all the rest and the whole space throughout which this matter was scattered was but finite. The matter on, uh, on the outside of the space would by its gravity tends towards all the matter in the world inside and by consequence fall upon. Uh, so, what, what he is trying to do uh, is to say that if the system were finite, then it will tend to collapse. But if the matter were even the diffuse throughout an infinite space, it would never convene into one mass. It will remain static. So, this was Newton's solution to the universe, problem of the universe and uh, <coughs> the date is December 10, 1692. But after some time, wh what happened? was that Newton discovered that uh, the overall uh, equilibrium that he was talking about was unstable. Because if he said matter slightly con congregates in one direction, then that the gravity in that direction would be more. So, more matter will be pulled in, the, in that direction. So, the gravity will get stronger and stronger and so, the whole universe will lose its uniformity and static nature. And so, he said this solution does not work. And he gives a very graphic example. He says if you take a needle standing on its point, it can at, at a given point stand at rest, but slight disturbance it will collapse. So, he said the universe is like a whole string of needles and any one of them falls, the whole thing will collapse. So, it was a very perceptive uh, view of what was going on and he did then did not go further as to how to resolve this situation. So, from Newton we go to Einstein as the next step and what did Einstein do was he assumed the same thing about the universe that Newton had assumed, homogeneous, isotropic, finite and static. Uh, Newton had uh, got, talked of uh, infinite universe. Uh, instead of finite, I would replace this world by boundless with no boundary. So, even if it is finite volume, it has no boundary. So, uh, uh, <coughs> Einstein's idea was given enough matter, the universe can be closed, that is, geometrically, it will be a finite system. Uh, is this a unique solution for homogeneous isotropic universe? Einstein believed so, because Einstein thought that he had got a ideal solution in which the curvature of space was determined by how much matter density was involved. So, he felt that it conveyed the spirit of relativity, that intimate relationship between matter and geometry. And what is more, he thought this was a unique solution of his equations. And if some solution is unique, then it has a special status. You feel that nature must follow that unique solution. So, he was very happy with this, but his happiness lasted for only a few months because De Sitter uh, found another solution which was quite different from uh, what Einstein had got. And this solution, the line element is given here. Uh, this was the way De Sitter had given it in his paper, uh, which is not the way you normally write the De Sitter line element. 
uh, you, you can write it in this form uh, by uh, some uh, coordinate transformation, you can convert it. And uh, uh, let, let me go to one point. Uh, when De Sitter published his, uh, yes, right. Uh, okay, this this top one is it or down? Uh, yes. Here, uh, what I want to f uh, tell you is that uh, De Sitter used very strange units to describe the matter, and uh, now we have uh, real light. <laughs> okay. And his units were the following. For mass, he chose the solar mass. Instead of grams per CGS units or MKS units, distance he chose was in astronomical units. And time he measured in one day. The very strange units. I don't know why or how he thought of this. So in those units, the speed of light is 173. You can work out, I think, <laughs> that this is, this is so. Uh, but anyway, uh, that is irrelevant. The point was that there was another solution perfectly respectable from Einstein's equations, which showed an expanding universe. And Einstein was little unhappy that there could be another perfectly reasonable solution. Both De Sitter and Einstein's solution used the lambda term, which was necessary to keep the universe uh, to get a proper solution. However, a few years later, Friedman uh, generated expanding world models both with or without lambda. So he could get solutions uh, without a lambda term. And he wrote to Einstein saying that this is possible. Uh, can you uh, comment on these solutions? Uh, now, in those days, uh, this was in 1922, when uh, Hubble's law, law had not yet surfaced. Uh, people still believed in static universe. So Einstein probably thought this was a mathematically interesting solution, but not physically relevant. So he, there is no record of his replying back to Friedman saying what he thought of it. But uh, what you should see is the fact that Friedman was not recognized till 1965 uh, for his work, which was done in 1922-24, although people had been using his solution. Uh, <coughs> I remember attending the 1962 Warsaw meeting of relativity. It was GR3, probably. And I, just, I was a graduate student. And there was a big Russian contingent. And they were all murmuring, saying a dissatisfaction that people are talking about Friedman model without talking about Friedman. So that means the, uh, the word Friedman or FRW, that is uh, F in the FRW is used today very commonly, that F was not there. And people used to talk about Robertson-Walker line element. So they said this is naturally bringing in the Westerners to give the credit, Robertson was American and Walker was British. But I think now justice has been done to Friedman's work so that 65 he has been, since 65 at least, last but not least. But other point was Friedman died very early. And so, so he never got to see uh, the expanding universe being vindicating his uh, work. This is very unfortunate, but because similarly Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild solution, he died early, and he didn't see his model being uh, recognized or, you know, so beware working those working in the relativity. <laughs> if you do significant work, you might <laughs> might not live. So sorry. So what happened was parallelly, Lemaitre, who was unaware of Friedman's work, independently derived the same solutions that Friedman had got. He also found a velocity-distance relation, the Hubble law. 
and he got the Hubble constant at 550 kilometers per second, close to Hubble's value two years later. So if you go to uh, Lemaitre's lab in Liège, the, the astrophysics lab, on the wall they have very prominently displayed Lemaitre's paper, including the, this particular conclusion of Hubble constant, showing that it was actually uh, Lemaitre who should be given the credit for Hubble's law rather than Hubble himself. So this is something one needs to uh, point out. And uh, just an indication of how this whole thing was in the air. Uh, uh, I once talked, my father was once talking to me about this, these days, 1920s and so on. Uh, he was a student of uh, Eddington, and uh, as a relativity student, he had solved Einstein's equation, and he got the same models, Friedman Lemaitre models. He showed it to Eddington. Now, Eddington was not aware of Lemaitre's work, which had come out in 27, because it was in, in a French journal. So he said, this work looks very good. We should publish it. So he asked him to pub, uh, write it up to publish in monthly notices. So while he was writing it up, uh, he, Eddington got a letter from Lemaitre saying, have you heard of this model which I had got? So when Eddington saw those, that he said, it is the same thing that uh, my father had worked out. So he called my father and said, I'm sorry, I was not aware of this work which had already appeared. So. Uh, there is no point in your writing it up again. But what Eddington did was he translated Lemaitre's paper and published it again in English in, in another journal so that people would know about it. So this was the situation uh, about uh, observational, early observational days. <coughs> so, but I want to go to a parallel thing. This was, sorry, a theoretical approach to cosmology, how far it had gone. Let's look at the observational approach. And the observational progress was slower than the theoretical one. And we can see the following. Uh, <coughs> there were a lot of controversies about the extragalactic universe. How is the universe distributed outside our galaxy? Uh, today, people or students who work in cosmology are unaware of what the subject has gone through. So they think everything is ready-made, take a homogeneous isotropic universe, uh, there are galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and so on. It's all given to you, but uh, I, I always feel that uh, in science, one should not only teach science, but also history of science, how the scientific ideas developed. So <clears throat> there was a debate uh, in, in around, uh, in, in the second decade of 20th century between Captain and Shapley. And the debate was, where is the sun located in the galaxy? And the majority view, which was represented by Captain, was that the universe is, the, the sun is at the center of the galaxy. This was the way Herschel had drawn the map of galaxy in which he had shown the sun at the center. Shapley was uh, arguing that the uh, uh, sun is not at the center, it is uh, off, the off center, quite some distance away from the theoretical center of the galaxy. So uh, what was the observational uh, proof given, uh, which resolved it in favor of Shapley, was that his measurements of globular clusters pointed to the galactic center being away from the sun in the direction of Sagittarius. Certain clusters of stars, which are called globular clusters, were distributed in, in a sort of certain direction which was away from the sun. So, and that suggested that the overall center of the galaxy lies in that direction. And uh, uh, the distance was estimated at around greater than 8 kiloparsecs. Uh, people went to 10 kiloparsecs, then came back to 8 kiloparsecs. Somewhere around this is uh, the right answer. 
Now, I want to also tell you that there is a cultural problem involved in this whole approach, and you will see the next one also, that somehow human beings want to place themselves at an important position in the universe. First, it was the geocentric theory that the Earth is fixed at the center of the universe, the whole thing goes around it. And it took a long time for people to realize this is not the case, and that the sun is at the center of the solar system. Then people thought the sun is very important because it is at the center of the galaxy. And therefore, the, this thing came as a disillusionment that sun is not at the center, but it's somewhere out, uh, quite some distance from the galaxy. So the next uh, issue was, where is our galaxy? And the people thought that our galaxy is the only important object in the universe. There is nothing else after our galaxy. Now there was, again, a majority versus minority view. Majority view was what I just described, that uh, th there are <coughs> some nebulae which were seen, that is cloud-like objects, which were, uh, question was, where are they located? And <coughs> the uh, 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 view expressed by a minority, Kant, Lambert, Proctor, Curtis, and later on Hubble, was that these nebulae are extragalactic. That means they are outside our galaxy, and they look fuzzy and unresolved because they are galaxies of stars very far away. So you don't see the stars clearly. But the man, uh, <coughs> majority, which were represented by Shapley, who, who was right in the first debate, was wrong in the second debate. And Van Manen, who was a very distinguished observer in Palomar Observatory, uh, in, uh, sorry, not Palomar, uh, Mount Wilson Observatory. So his observations were in, uh, used by Shapley and others to show that the nebulae are part of our galaxy. So there was a uh, controversy, and the uh, <coughs> debate, uh, there was a debate which took place between Curtis and Shapley. Curtis representing minority and Shapley majority. And <clears throat> the reason what Van Manen was saying was that these fuzzy things showed an across the line of sight motion, that is transverse motion. And if they are extragalactic, uh, uh, these proper motions, 0.1 arc second per year, would translate to Quite, very, uh, quite a large velocity, 15,000 kilometers per second. And they said this will be too large for equilibrium of galactic system. And so they can't be uh, outside the galaxy. They can't be very far away. <coughs> and uh, so of course, when this conclusion is drawn, you should ask, uh, are the observations good enough for this thing? So when Manon's observations uh, people tried to repeat, but they could not get those transverse motions that people were find, uh, Van Manen had reported. He was, however, a very distinguished uh, astronomer, so uh, even Hubble, who was getting contradictory answers, did not uh, contradict him openly. They were in the same observatory, so colleagues. But Van Manen was respected, greatly respected. Hubble was a new uh, kind of astronomer. So he went very circumspectly. He get, started working on different galaxies. He found their shapes and so on. And he, uh, in a way, he completely sidestepped what Van Manen had said. So he didn't get into in, in controversy. And gradually showed that these galaxies are extragalactic. They are not part of our system. So it's very interesting to read some of the accounts of those uh, days. Uh, <coughs> Jeffrey Burbage was, has written on that. And you will find it in our book, uh, the book by Bur Burbage, myself, and Hoyle, uh, called uh, A Different Approach to Cosmology. We have given the background history. So you will find this thing described. So let us 
Now come to Hubble's law itself. Now Hubble uh, <coughs> found gradually uh, spectral shifts, uh, that is the lines shifting towards the red end and the amount of shift was uh, greater for more distant galaxies, fainter and smaller galaxies. So, he got a straight line relation and the points through which he was drawing the straight line, these points are given here. Now, you can statistically always draw a straight line, uh, but is, is, does this uh, really convince you that there is a velocity distance relation? Especially what happened was some of these distances are not correctly measured, were not measured by Hubble correctly. This was realized and in 1981, Hewitt uh, re-plotted the same points uh, here. So, you can see there is a one point here. Now, uh, do you see a rise or do you, can you draw a horizontal line? What can you draw? In short, observationally, the data was not really uh, good enough to draw the conclusion that the universe is expanding. But the conclusion that was drawn turned out to be correct because later on people found more of galaxies and further out and they were consistent with expansion. One could make a similar criticism or comment on the very famous bending of light experiment which Eddington did. He found the result consistent with, uh, new, uh, with the Einstein prediction rather than Newton's. And there is an account of all the errors that were involved which were ignored or not taken into consideration. No, knowingly also some observations were set aside which, uh, which seem to be pro-Newton. And uh, one could say that the, the result really did not deserve the uh, unequivocal uh, conclusion in favor of Einstein for bending of light. But later, data has subsequently reduced the error bars considerably and today we can argue that certainly relativity is supported unequivocally by bending of light. But this is all history now what I am talking about. So this is Hewitt plotting, re-plotting Hubble's data. So, uh, <coughs> What about the Hubble relation itself? Uh, so it was in the air since the early 1920s. Many people felt there was a shift in the spectra which is in proportion to distance. And uh, there were people like Wurtz, then Lundmark, uh, who had found uh, this relation. I had already given Lemaitre's 1927 and Hubble can be credited with giving a most comprehensive observational basis for velocity and distance, but he was certainly not the first to say about, talk about. And the value which Hubble gets, uh, which was accepted in cosmology till 1952, was H naught equal to 550 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Today the value given is about 70. So, just 70, not 570. So, you can see by what factor corrections have been made subsequently. So, in 1929, uh, cosmology had become interesting enough for New York Times to uh, refer to an expanding universe on the front page. So, the, the uh, <coughs> sorry, let's. Uh, I seem to have jumped very far ahead. Yeah, this is where I was. Uh, <coughs> so when the expanding universe idea became well uh, received by people, Einstein had <coughs> second thoughts about lambda term that he had introduced in order to get the static universe because he saw that uh, uh, solutions were available without lambda which showed expanding universe. 
So what you call the Occam's razor, that is minimum assumptions are good or better in a theory <coughs> than a theory which has more parameters. So he said, let's discard lambda. And uh, the much, much publicized remark about of Einstein that it was the greatest blunder he had committed in his life. Uh, I tried to look up in various books. You never find this remark in Einstein having said this. So I mentioned to a few experts, and they said, no, he never said that. Then how did it come that Einstein said this? So he said, it turns out that Gamma wrote an autobiography in which he says that Einstein talk, had visited him and they talked about cosmology, and Einstein had said that to him. So it's a kind of hearsay remark which a court of law would not allow. That is, he told me like this. But it, in a sense, Einstein was certainly disillusioned. So in that sense, he was correct. Uh, and he dis discarded lambda. But at, and they, they, there is a paper by Einstein and De Sitter together in which they put a lambda equal to 0 and k equal to 0, the curvature parameter 0, and they got the simplest model, which was, of course, obtained by Friedman earlier. But it was not, uh, Friedman's, Friedman's paper had not been appreciated by then. So now we come to uh, this. Can the a curvature parameter be determined by observations. That is, you have this line element, Robertson Walker. This is uh, homogeneous isotropic expanding space. S is a function of time. K can be 0, 1, or minus 1. So, can we determine K whether the universe is open or closed? This is what Hubble wanted to do as the next project. So what he wanted to do was to count galaxies brighter than a given magnitude. Up to a given faintless, faint level, you count how many galaxies are there. And if the galaxies are equally bright, then you can have a Euclidean geometry prediction. If the geometry is Euclidean and k is equal to 0, log n would be 0.6 magnitude plus constant. So magnitude is the same what Einstein, uh, astronomers use for measuring the apparent brightness of a galaxy. And this is what you would expect. So what Hubble wanted to see was whether this relation holds, or if there is a curvature effect, then this curve will either, this is a log n against m would be a straight line. So the, the situation was, uh, uh, yeah, here I can. This is m and this is log n. So as you increase m, you are going to fainter galaxies. This is what you have to remember. Physicists are often dismayed by the astronomers' units, where magnitude increasing, would you would think it is talking of a brighter and brighter galaxy, but it's a fainter galaxy. So uh, <coughs> what you would log in, uh, if you have this, this thing. Now, are you going to get this, or are you going to get this, or are you going to get this? This, <coughs> this would decide whether you are talking about uh, faint, uh, k equal to 0, or plus 1, or minus 1. So uh, <coughs> when Hubble started uh, counting galaxies up to given magnitude, he realized that the problem was uh, impossibly hard. That means there are so many galaxies that if you really want to see the difference between the three possibilities, you have to go to very faint galaxies. So faint means if you are looking at very far away distance, there are a lot of galaxies you have to count. So it would have been physically impossible for them to do this work. Now today, people can do this work because they can read the plates automatically by a, a, a computer. And the computer can count whether there are a million galaxies or two million galaxies. 
which you can imagine if you start doing by hand or by eyes, you cannot do it in your lifetime. So Hubble, of course, was unaware that or, or didn't expect the computers to be discovered so soon. So uh, what he thought was that he can use this inadequacy of approach to ask for a better instrument. So he was that much of a politician you know, to, to, so he said, he proposed the 200 inch telescope. I said, give me a better telescope, I can tell you whether the universe is open or closed. This, this was his idea. So, uh, but as you know, the telescope takes a long time to make and there was a second world war in between while this happened. So by the time the telescope was completed and commissioned, Hubble had realized that even that telescope is not going to resolve this problem because the number, he could certainly count to greater distance because the galaxies, fainter galaxies could be seen by a better telescope. The best telescope before this was 100 inch. So if you are happy with metric system, five meter and uh, two, two and a half meter. So he wanted a five meter telescope uh, and which would mean four times as much area, surface, a collecting area. That would mean you can go uh, at least twice as far as in the, with the older telescope. But the number to be counted would certainly increase. Mm -hmm. And he realized that it cannot be done. So uh, <coughs> he realized the futility of the attempt and uh, The reason was N need becomes very large number to be counted. M must go down to very faint value, so you are not very certain about what magnitude you are counting. When you are going to very faint objects, you, your accuracy level goes haywire. Then there is a standard candle hypothesis that each galaxy has got the same brightness. Otherwise, you will have a very faint galaxy, intrinsically faint galaxy, uh, will look faint, so you will think it's very far away, but it may be very close. So you can run into all kinds of problems with, if this hypothesis is not reliable. And there may be evolution, that is if the universe is expanding as changing its properties, more distant galaxies might be brighter than the present one or vice versa, we don't know, until we know that we cannot interpret our observation. So all these problems were surfacing and Hubble gradually uh, forgot about it. He said, Let, I mean, wh what he had promised. And other people also, uh, they had realized it sooner than Hubble, but they could not uh, call Hubble wrong because Hubble had a, his own stature by then. So they, they kept, just as Hubble was avoiding confrontation with Van Manen, other astronomers were feeling that Hubble was not quite right, but they didn't want to say so. But Hubble himself realized that it's not going to work out, so uh, he felt that he had given a, whatever, for wrong reasons, uh, he had given a good telescope to the astronomical community, it can be used for other purposes. And this is something which uh, recalls to my mind uh, a, a statement made by Chandrasekhar when he was introduced, uh, he was interviewed by some of us in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, I have the tape, uh, taped version of that uh, in interview, uh, now on DVD. Uh, that he said that Eddington and Hubble had called a press conference when they announced, that when the 200 inch was approved for construction in the 30s. So uh, the uh, press asked them, what are you expecting to find with this object? What are you, why are you building it? So he said that if you knew the answer, what we will see with it, there is no point in building this instrument. So which means he had an open mind as to what you should do. Today, if you want to have a telescope, you have to give an extensive uh, report saying what you are going to find with it, what has been found, how is it going to add to it. There are different columns which you have to answer. So that, that openness of or the spirit of adventure has 
gone out of science if you are only looking for the expected thing. So this, this is something I want to comment on later also. So let us now come to something which added spice to the whole picture, uh, which, was, which was developed till about 1940s. I will come back to that development later. Uh, an alternative to the standard cosmology which Hubble and uh, Friedman and Lemaitre's models had given uh, was proposed by Bondi and Gold and Hoyle separately. Uh, but they were, they were all discussing it together uh, in their uh, <coughs> wartime activities. It, they were all working together during the Second World War and afterwards they kept working in Cambridge. So the steady state theory evolved out of uh, this and what Bondi and Gold argued was that if you want to do cosmology, you must have what is called perfect cosmological principle. Now the argument is this, that cosmological principle uh, which you follow in uh, de uh, deriving the Friedman, Robertson, Walker model says that the universe is the same at all points at a given time. So you have here, uh, let me If you take t equal to constant as surfaces, hypersurfaces in space time, so t is going this way, then t equal to constant, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic according to our assumption. So supposing we are here somewhere and we are looking at uh, universe at very large distances. So this is the light cone drawn backwards. So a light ray comes from very far away to here. Now what has happened, as you notice, it is in intersecting these surfaces at earlier and earlier times. Now <coughs> what Bondi and Gold's argument was that if the physical laws were different at these epochs, and there is no way you can ensure that they were the same, if the physical laws were different, how do you interpret what you see here, here, or here? Because your yardstick is something that you know here. But if, say, speed of light is different or Planck's constant is different, then you cannot uh, interpret exactly. There will always be that doubt. So how do you get around that doubt? You simply say that the physics was the same all over. If that is uh, guaranteed, then every, we can do cosmology. So they said you can do this by assuming a perfect cosmological principle which says that as you go in time, forward in time, there is no change in the physical properties of the universe. So these hypersurfaces are the same. So their argument was that perfect cosmological principle is necessary in order to uh, do any cosmological interpretation. Otherwise, you have to go on varying your physics uh, and how you vary it. And you see the effect these days when you talk of early universe, very early universe, people use physics which is unknown to us in the laboratory here. So I will come back to that later. But, so they said have a perfect cosmological principle which says that the universe is the same at all times. If it is the same at all times, the Hubble constant will be constant. And since Hubble constant is S dot over S, that is time derivative of S divided by S, S is proportional to E to the HT. So this is the expansion rate. And <clears throat> the matter that you see today, matter density has always been the same. So if the universe is expanding and the matter density is same, how do you manage this? Because matter density will thin out if the universe expanded. So to do this, you need to create new matter. So they said new matter appears in the universe 
at an average rate which is given here 3 h q uh, 3 h rho. So, the observed density multiplied by 3 times the Hubble constant and that works out as 10 to the minus 46 grams per centimeter cube. It is extremely small uh, value. Uh, so, you in the laboratory you cannot detect it, but astronomically they argued that you should be able to find it. They did not have any field equations because they, uh, they went by this deductive uh, perfect cosmological principle, but <coughs> so this was, so they could not say what Hubble constant would be for a given density. Now this was Bondi and Gold's idea. But Hoyle approached a new approach. He said, uh, we take Einstein's field equations as basic and add to it a new scalar field such that uh, we can explain the continuous creation of matter. So it is not left something vague, but can be quantitatively defined. So he, th this is the matter energy tensor and the uh, scalar field C that he used. Uh, to work out uh, a new energy tensor. And <coughs> the idea was that uh, the total divergence is 0, but individually the terms the divergence is not 0. So, you can explain creation of matter. In 1960, Maurice Price, uh, <coughs> who was in a sense uh, Hoyle's mentor, uh, in, incidentally, I, I should tell you uh, one story about Fred Hoyle's uh, uh, supervisor. Uh, he had a checkered history, well, he never got a satisfactory supervisor for his PhD. <coughs> uh, so what happened was he first had uh, Pyrels uh, to supervise, but, uh, and he did some work in quantum electrodynamics and so on. But he was more attracted to astronomy, so he wanted to change. Then uh, somebody told him you should go to Dirac and talk to him. So <laughs> Dirac, of course, didn't want any, any students. So he said that if you uh, will not bother me with questions, I am willing to act as your supervisor. That means uh, don't come and see me, and I will be your supervisor. Hoyle said that suits me because I don't want my supervisor telling me what to do. So, so they, on that basis, they agreed to be uh, working together. And after some time, you know, Maurice Price who was around in Cambridge. Uh, he had interaction with Hoyle, and Hoyle got along well with him. But Maurice Price was never his official supervisor. So. Uh, and later on, Hoyle discovered that if he gets a PhD, he would be taxable according to British law. So he said, I will not take a PhD at all. So there were many people in the 1930s, 20s in Cambridge who felt that PhD was a kind of uh, way out of the system. If you are really contributing research, you will be writing papers and these papers would tell people that you are good in research. The PhD level is not necessary. So he never got his PhD. Hoyle uh, was without a PhD. So this was uh, <coughs> uh, the Maurice Price who gave a formulation of this tensor in terms of a scalar field, uh, which uh, later on became known as the C field, which Hoyle and I used extensively. So this field equations can then generate this Dissiter metric as the solution, and H is a constant as in perfect cosmological principle. So you can, in a way, uh, give the mathematics behind the perfect cosmological principle by following Hoyle's method. So uh, I, I will finish by describing uh, one uh, important controversy which arose in connection with steady state uh, cosmology. Because when there were two cosmologies in the field, one was the Big Bang and the other was the steady state, the question naturally came in front of the observers, who is right? How do you decide? So one way was Hoyle's, uh, Hubble's original program of counting galaxies. Now, as you 
saw uh, by 1950 or so on when the steady state theory was in the field, uh, Hubble had already given up on counting galaxies that it was going to be a very uh, problematic thing. So, he <coughs> said uh, the radio astronomers instead came and said we will take up your program because radio galaxies are very few. So, you, we do not have the problem of counting and we they also felt that they can look at very far away distances because the radio uh, galaxies are very powerful uh, emitters of radiation. The only thing that they fell short of in uh, relation to the optical counterpart was that they could not measure the redshift of galaxies with radio wavelength. So, for that they had to go to optical astronomers to optically see the same object and measure it redshift, which of course took away the advantage they had that they can say very far away, if, if they, they much further than the optical people can. But if they cannot check the distance and with unless the optical people saw it, then the, that disadvantage, uh, that advantage goes. So, <coughs> this, this one and two. Uh, and three, the disadvantage I, I mentioned. So, what they want to do, wanted to do was the same thing that optical astronomers did. In a Euclidean geometry, if all galaxies were equally bright, luminosity is L, the faintest source within a given distance d will be, uh, will have a flux S proportional to L over 4 pi d square. This is a geometrical factor. And the number of sources within a volume D uh, of radius D is proportional to D cube. So, in a Euclidean geometry, what you expect to see the <coughs> is it, uh, D log n over D log s, if you take n and s like this, is minus 1.5. So, <coughs> the question was what was the actual situation? Now, there is again a episode which I would like to narrate to you uh, because uh, without such human episodes the cosmology would become a dry subject. So, Ryle and Gold, Gold was the origin one of the co-originators of steady state theory and Ryle was the radio astronomer who had offered to do this test. Now, they themselves had a checkered history of controversy. Uh, in the very early days of radio sources, Ryle claimed that all radio sources are stars in our galaxy. Uh, again, the same kind of thing that they cannot be very far, anything beyond our galaxy. So, Gold said looking at some of these things, they, they appear to be outside the galaxy and they are distant radio sources. So, this uh, kept on coming. Uh, all the time and ultimately Gold was banned from attending Cavendish seminars which Ryle had organized because he would ask these awkward questions all the time. So, <coughs> but eventually they found the radio source Cygnus A which was one of the bright radio sources. So, uh, it was identified with a galaxy outside our own. So, that proved Gold, gold right and Ryle was very annoyed with that conclusion and he then said ok, I will test your theory and disprove it. So, uh, that is the reason why Ryle was somewhat prejudiced against the steady state theory uh, and of course, the culturally everybody liked the big bang theory because it gave rise to creation at a given time. So, these cultural aspects are always very important when you examine Ryle's family was uh, of several bishops. So, there was a religious uh, kind of uh, bias in, in him, uh, which came out whenever people discussed uh, implications of his work. Anyway, this slope was expected to be minus 1.5. If you took the expanding universe, the slope would become 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, etc. That is the it, it would be prediction. Now, what Ryle found in 1955 was n that is this index n was 3. So, minus 3 said that is so much more than 1.5 that the steady state theory is disproved. 
Then after 1958, he did found that there were errors in the earlier survey, so he redid this thing, and he came down to 2.2. Then in 1961, he redid did it with more, more accuracy. He found it came to 1.8. Now, when he announced this result in, um, in the Royal Astronomical Society, Bondi was asked to comment. And Bondi said, this is the history. Uh, I, he said, I am willing to wait another two, three years. It will come down to 1.5. So that annoyed Royal Ryle very much. Uh, because this was a kind of suggesting that he had been making mistakes, which in fact he had not appreciated the errors. So <clears throat> what happened was, uh, what uh, other surveys, like Mills in Australia and Bolton in Caltech, they found that slopes were consistent with 1.5. But of course the situation was, Ryle was looking at a northern hemisphere, and Mills was looking at Southern Hemisphere. So there could be difference between North and South, but there were certain common areas of the two surveys. And there it turned out gradually that uh, Mills was better organized in detecting errors than, than Ryle. So this thing was get, go, getting into melting pot, and in 1961, <coughs> uh, uh, when Ryle's data came, Hoyle took it seriously. He said, we should try to understand why it is deeper. And our reply was, uh, that is when I was his graduate student and we started working out mathematical models. We said that there is inhomogeneity in the universe on the scale of 50 megaparsecs. So that is, you can have superclusters and voids. This was in 1961. and. Uh, uh, if you are hap uh, if you happen to be somewhere uh, in the border, you will see uh, initial values very low, and then it will suddenly start steepening because you will see large values. So inhomogeneities will happen. Uh, at that time, I offered to do a computer simulation, and I think this must be the first cosmo uh, cosmological simulations I were done on a computer. Uh, <coughs> Hoyle said the Cambridge computer is not good enough for doing this work because it is uh, uh, very uh, 